students uh, all doing Thank all well much. yeah yeah it's uh, everybody is coming in everybody is still supposed to be masked in common areas yes but um classes are basically offline and uh, we have had very few offline seminars so far um mm. but there are a few visitors and things so we had uh, a hybrid uh, thesis defense this morning mm. where the external was, uh, examiner was offline and uh, was online and a few others were online but yes we were in one room yeah we've been doing that for some time it's actually so convenient you know because thesis advice uh, yeah. i mean examiners don't have to come dashing across the country or somewhere else in the world yes just it for makes thesis. Sense. It's, yeah. it's nice actually i i mean i really do miss the in person interaction but uh, considering it uh, okay one more question jason are you okay with uh, recording this talk yeah sure yeah, okay so we have a youtube channel and we would put it up there at some point later sure there's so by the way when uh, yeah. vishnuan starts the introduction you can uh, start recording and yeah, i think it's already live on youtube at this point it is yeah. i think but uh, yeah. what will go up eventually more will be the edited version i think yes yes yeah okay so should we maybe get started there's sure. just around four. yes yeah. i think we can okay so okay welcome uh, everyone to this uh, distinguished uh, lecture series as part of uh, the 75th year of uh, india's independence the azadi ka amrit mahotsav uh, today's uh, speaker will be professor uh, jyotsna dhawan to introduce her i call upon uh, professor ravindran the uh, director of imc professor ravindran Sir, are you muted? Yes. Uh... Sorry. Yeah. So, um, it's indeed uh, a pleasure to welcome Professor Jyotsna Dhawan as our accom speaker, and uh, we all know that uh, we are celebrating 75 years of independence, of also 60 years of IMC. I'm really thankful to her for agreeing to give this talk. uh um, in the eminent uh, scientist uh, category and uh, for uh, for the benefit of uh, our audience i would like to actually say a few words about uh, professor jyotsna dhawan she is the ceo of dpt welcome trust india alliance an organization that funds the best and the brightest in the biomedical research ecosystem in the country and uh, she is also a cell and developmental biologist who has worked on stem cells and uh, tissue repair for past 80 years she has led a research group working on muscle system cells at the csir center for cellular and molecular biology and was involved in establishment of dbt which uh, you know it is involved institute for stem cells and science and regenerative medicine and this is situated in bangalore jyotsna has been actively involved in mentoring young biologists in variety of efforts aimed at building an enabling system of research and education she has served as the president of the indian society for cell biology the indian society for developmental biologists and the and, and she is a fellow of indian national latinos science and i again welcome her for this uh, uh evening talk at imsc uh thank you again for agreeing to give this Talk, uh, and I leave it to you. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Um, you are audible. Uh, just one comment: we have, I think, twenty participants on Zoom and about uh, eight watching on YouTube. If anybody has a question, perhaps you can type it in the chat box on either Zoom or YouTube, and I will uh, pause the speaker to uh, take the question. There can also be questions at the end. Uh, over to you, Jyotsna. thank you uh, thank you so much professor ravindran for inviting me for this uh, uh, lecture um, to celebrate the 75th year of our independence and the 60th year of math science it's a huge privilege for me uh, i have to tell you that as a biologist uh, you know one of those old time biologists uh, or sort of uh, what 
what uh, quantitative scientists think of biologists. I am one of those who has a deep uh, trepidation towards the mathematical side, and it uh, uh, gives me a huge pleasure to be speaking in front of an audience uh, at Math Science. So uh, thank you for that, and thank you, Rahul, for uh, uh, you know the interactions uh, over the years in in multiple different fora, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about work that's been done in my lab uh, over the last uh, many years, but also I would like to situate it in the context of the field. Uh, so many of the things that I'm talking about have really been uh, done by uh, other groups, uh, and uh, I thought I would try and give an overall feeling of where the field is going, uh, and I will point out uh, which aspects are uh, the specific work of my lab. So uh, I titled my talk The Quiet Life because uh, we work on muscle stem cells in their dormant phase and how this dormant phase is important for tissue repair. So if I can have the next slide. So when we think about muscle, we think about uh, young active muscle as represented by our wonderful sportsmen in the most recent Olympics. Uh, and it's such a matter of pride for me to show this slide uh, with all of these medal winners. So muscle actually comprises a fairly large uh, percentage of body mass uh, for those of us who are young and active. Of course, for those of us who sit behind a, a computer screen all the time, this might be significantly less. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so just uh, sort of thinking about the biology of muscle, it's not just a major part of the human body that enables movement, but it's also a major metabolic tissue. Uh, it controls movement of the limbs, uh, and there are multiple muscles of the face which allow us to express emotions. The diaphragm is a muscle that helps us to breathe, it's critical. The jaw and the throat muscles help us to swallow. The, the eye muscles uh, around uh, uh, the eyes are extremely important for eye movement. And as we all know, uh, exercise is very important to maintain muscle function but muscle is lost both in disease and in aging and movement becomes difficult and it can impact all of these other muscles that I've shown you up here, particularly breathing. Now the heart is also a muscle, but cardiac muscle is uh, quite different from skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is voluntary muscle uh, and cardiac muscle has different molecular and cellular origins. So I'm going to restrict my talk today to skeletal muscle, which is what we study. And we study the stem cells of skeletal muscle, which are responsible for making muscle during development and for repairing muscle later in adult life. And the overall thrust of my talk is that if we can maintain muscle stem cell function, we can help prevent muscle loss during aging and disease. But in order to do that, we have to understand molecularly and cellularly the interactions of muscle stem cells with their environment and what happens within them and how it's controlled. Next slide, please. So up on the top, I'm showing you with these, these pink uh, pictures are essentially cross sections through muscle tissue, showing you on the left, uh, normal muscle tissue. And then what happens during an injury where you have a major disruption of the normal beautiful tissue architecture, but two weeks later, you have a perfectly regenerated muscle. So there's a very re robust re uh, regeneration response. And what happens actually is that damage to the muscle, uh, which can be because of traumatic injury or because of disease, actually leads to the death of the myofibers, uh, which are the muscle fibers, and the activation of the adult muscle stem cells, which, are, which I'm abbreviating here as MUSC or satellite cells. And they're called satellite cells. They were uh, first found in 1960s by Alexander Mauro, who found that there were these cells which were located at the periphery of the, of the skeletal muscle fibers, which uh, actually seemed to get activated during uh, a tissue repair response, and then made new cells which fused back into the muscle fiber and uh, allowed their repair or regeneration. And on the bottom, uh, the green uh, picture that you see uh, is actually the little green dots are muscle stem cells sitting on top of a large 
syncytial myofiber. And a syncytium is a cell that is formed by the fusion of multiple precursor cells. And that's how uh, myofibers develop during embryonic development. Next slide, please. So adult muscle stem cells or the satellite cells are dormant. I'm sorry, there seems to be a little uh, uh, sort of cut off of the uh, lettering, but uh, muscle stem cells that's shown in the top left figure is uh, uh, sleeping on top of the surface of a myofiber. They get activated during a damage response and proliferate and make a little clone of cells and then return back to sleep. And in vivo, these muscle stem cells actually sleep between two membranes on a bed of myofibers. Uh, and the two membranes are laminin, which is the extracellular matrix, and dystrophin, which is the bottom, uh, are just underneath the plasma membrane of the myofibers, shown here in red. And uh, I'm showing you this brightly lit up green cell uh, on, uh, in this bottom panel, uh, labeled with PAC7, which is the marker for a muscle stem cell. Uh, and this is due to a, a genetic mark in a mouse, which was created by uh, Sharagim Tajbaksh at the Pasteur Institute, who generously shared these mice with us. Uh, and at the very bottom, you can see the nucleus of uh, the, the muscle stem cell in blue. Uh, so waking up these muscle stem cells is very important for repairing the damaged muscle. But if you want to have the possibility for a future regenerative response, you need to send those muscle stem cells back to sleep to make new stem cells. Uh, so as a result, one of the things that fascinated me ever since I got into the field of muscle was to understand how uh, this dormant or quiescent phase is important uh, for the biology of that muscle stem cell. Uh, and it, you know, it became apparent uh, very uh, quickly that understanding this dormant phase is important for uh, improving repair. And I hope to convince you of that over the course of the next uh, few slides. Next slide, please. So in muscle diseases typified by the muscular dystrophies, which are genetic diseases, uh, you have a loss of muscle and you can see that there's continual atrophy of the skeletal muscle. So it's a very serious problem for a very large number of people. There are very big num uh, 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 large number of mutations, different genetic mutations which attack different elements of the muscle proteome to create these types of dystrophies. I won't go into those in detail, but if I can have the next slide. Uh, you know, uh, I'm just listing here uh, a, a, a small subset of the different types of neuromuscular disorders that are seen. Uh, and these come collectively under the, the, the sobriquet of rare diseases. However, because of the number of patients who suffer from, from them, this is really a very large number of people indeed, and a very important target uh, for uh, therapeutic uh, um, avenues. And different muscular neuromuscular diseases vary in their pattern of inheritance, the origin of the mutation, the types of uh, symptoms, et cetera. And because muscle is such a large tissue, it's a very large and distributed therapeutic target in the event of disease. So it needs, we need to think about ways in which we can target uh, these uh, very disparate types of diseases. And from about 30 years ago, people have been trying to target muscle stem cells as a therapeutic avenue, but there are some serious challenges and I'll tell you a little bit about them. Next slide, please. So there are many uh, potential applications of stem cells, and but there are uh, some serious mitigating factors that need to be taken in, into consideration before we can actually use these cells therapeutically. Next slide, please. Now, what are the outstanding issues with stem cell transplantation for the musculopathies? As I mentioned, the skeletal muscle represents a very large and distributed target. So you need very large numbers of stem cells to be transplanted. And with our current knowledge, it's not a practical approach because you would have to essentially target injections of stem cells into uh, many, many different tissues in the body or the muscle in the body. And the, the fact is that inherited myopathies are degenerative, they're progressive, and they lead to an irretrievable pathophysiology. So many in the field have been thinking of ways to prevent degeneration. 
And in order to do that, we also need to understand the normal homeostatic repair and regeneration at a molecular and cellular level. And an idea that has emerged over the years is about targeting endogenous muscle stem cells to repair diseased muscle. But for that, we need to understand how, uh, apart from many other things about muscle stem cells, the molecular control of their dormancy, their activation, and their participation in repair, including their interactions with other cells in the body. Next slide, please. So, uh, one of the things about dystrophic muscle is that it can mount a response, a repair response, but it very rapidly exhausts its natural capacity because of repeated degeneration, because the actual mutation leads to the degeneration of the myofiber and is not targeted at the muscle stem cell. So even if you keep waking up the stem cell, they get exhausted with repeated rounds of repair. So uh, we are interested in understanding this dormant phase to offer a new perspective in regeneration. Uh, next slide, please. So I showed this uh, slide earlier, and just to recapitulate that the muscle stem cells sleep between these two membranes, uh, and we need to wake them up to repair. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we uh, that was evident very early on in the in the field was that if you isolate these muscle stem cells or satellite cells from their little myofiber niche, you break the quiescent state. So you can, you can isolate them very efficiently using flow cytometry. And as I told you, one of the tricks that we use is to use these marker mice in which the muscle stem cells glow green. So we can use flow cytometry to get a highly purified population. But when they are isolated, uh, they're uh, no longer quiescent. They have been activated. So one of the things that was a big challenge for us in our early days was to find that this quiescence in vivo was not directly amenable to any kind of genome-wide analysis and uh, posed a serious challenge for understanding the uh, attributes of deep quiescence. So we decided to move to a cell culture model shown in the next slide. So we established, we spent some time in establishing a number of different models to generate this genome scale data on, on quiescence. And the strategy was to simply use different methods to induce dormancy in culture. So you can proliferate cells, muscle stem cells or myoblasts in culture very readily. And there are also some very useful uh, mouse and human cell lines available. Uh, for being able to do these studies. And one way to do it is that when you remove mitogens, most of the culture will actually fuse and make these beautiful myotubes, which are essentially the in vitro correlate of a myofiber. The, but a few of them resist this particular pathway and become quiescent. They're also called uh, reserve cells. So about 20% of that population will stay quiescent, whereas the rest of them will become differentiated. Now, this is useful, but not super useful if you're doing genomics, because then you again have to purify the quiescent cells. So we came up with a way of removing substrate adhesion, which is essentially a way of removing mechanochemical signaling. And when they lose contractility, cells become quiescent, especially cells of this type, uh, the muscle stem cells. And uh, we also found different ways of in, in directly inhibiting contractility with small molecule inhibitors or by growing them on soft substrates so that the mechanical signals are not transduced. So all of these methods uh, allow us to achieve uh, uh, close to 100% quiescent population, which is useful then for being able to uh, look at the molecular attributes of this state. Next slide, please. So uh, an, an early surprise was that quiescent cells appeared better at self-renewing than proliferating cells. And in, in a sense, this uh, seemed very counterintuitive. Uh, so shown here is a colony formation assay. It's sort of uh, analogous to the bacterial colonies that you see, but these are, these are mammalian cells uh, stained with a dye to show you the different, the little dots are colonies with uh, hundreds of cells in them. And uh, on the left is a proliferating population, which gives you say 50 to 100 uh, uh, colonies. But on the right is a population that, so it started with the same cell number, say a thousand cells, and you plate them down. And if they were proliferating, they give you this many colonies as seen on the left. But if they had been previously quiescent, they seem to have some kind of 
uh, enhanced capability of making colonies. So what that suggests is that self-renewal is enhanced while the cell is not dividing. And it suggests the induction of a cellular regenerative program, something like an anticipation of uh, um, building strength uh, while asleep. So next slide, please. Um, so using a variety of techniques, um, microarrays in the early days and RNA-seq more recently, what we found was that when we compared asynchronous proliferating cells as shown on the top with different forms of cell cycle arrest, uh, we found that this reversible cell cycle arrest, which typifies quiescence or dormancy, was different from the senescence, which is an irreversible arrest and uh, associated with aging phenotypes, apoptosis, which is associated with death, or differentiation, which is associated with specialization. All of these other forms of arrest are irreversible, whereas quiescence is uh, unique in being able to revert back to proliferation. And what we found was that in this genetic signature of deep quiescence, there were uh, strong programs that inhibited the other out of cycle states. And it suggested that these were the ways in which the cell uh, promoted stem cell function through metabolic adaptations, the induction of survival and repair and longevity pathways, and the re uh, repression of other forms of uh, arrest like differentiation. Um, Next slide, please. So using this model system, we've identified over the years a number of new regulators of quiescence using our culture model. And having uh, gotten our hands on these proteins, we then went back in vivo to test that they, in fact, uh, have the right uh, expression profile uh, and are turned on at the appropriate stages uh, of uh, the, the muscle satellite cell um, uh, cycle. So uh, just as examples, I show you that we isolated several uh, chromatin factors, uh, for, for example, uh, a molecule called P8, which is Im important for this, uh, the proliferation part, uh, and two molecules called PRDM2 and MLL5, which are important for the return to reversible arrest. Uh, so we were able to locate then the molecules that we identified from our culture system to a specific stage in the, 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 the sort of uh, life cycle of the muscle stem cell, an, an early stage. Next slide, please. Now, uh, I skip to, uh, uh, to inform you about recent studies in the field uh, which were done by uh, uh, Philip Murikis uh, and Sharagim Tajbaks at the Pasteur and uh, Tom Rando at Stanford, where they have actually superseded now the need for a, an in vitro system. And what they did was to offer a very interesting new view of quiescence by directly fixing the muscle stem cells in vivo, uh, very likely with paraformaldehyde to prevent their activation during isolation, and then isolate these cells and uh, do genome-wide analysis like RNA-seq, which is possible. Uh, you can't do functional studies on these cells because they are fixed and so no longer alive, but you get very excellent RNA preparations. And what these two labs uh, uh, found was that the in situ fixation redefined the quiescence program and gave us a, a, a somewhat different transcriptional profile than what had been seen before. Uh, and so when we compared, next slide, please. Our muscles uh, uh, sort of stem cell model, which is based on a, a, a C2, C12 myoblast, mouse myoblast system, which is, with, these are uh, um, a proliferating line of myogenic cells. We compared these to the data that we got from the published work of um, Tom Chung, Tom Rando, and uh, uh, Sharagim Tajbaks and, and uh, uh, Philip Murikis. And it was really gratifying to see that if you see the blue circle, you see that the, the sort of green triangles uh, which represent the fixed satellite cells or the quiescent, deeply quiescent satellite cells in vivo, and the 
little green boxes, uh, the rectangles, they uh, uh, cluster together in a principal component analysis. And act, uh, this is of RNA-seq data uh, done from you know, three different labs and uh, compared to ours. Whereas the proliferating myoblasts, the activated satellite cells, and the unfixed satellite cells, which would essentially be what used to be called uh, uh, um, quiescent satellite cells because they were freshly isolated without fixation, they cluster in very different portions of, uh, 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 of the analysis. So what that suggests is then that you know, these myoblasts, which have been in culture for you know, 40 years uh, uh, intermittently, uh, remember their origin so well uh, as to really compare to the freshly isolated quiescent satellite cells. And this was extremely gratifying. Uh, we haven't yet published this work. We are just uh, uh, in the uh, process of uh, trying to get our paper uh, 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 revised. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm showing you here the little uh, red cell uh, on the sitting on the top of a, uh, a muscle fiber. Uh, I, I love this picture because it it, it looks almost like a, 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 an arm muscle. Uh, and uh, next uh, slide. Just to remind you that the quiescent cell sits on top of the myofiber and uh, is dormant. And when activated, creates a, a pool of new proliferating cells of which most go back uh, and fuse to make the myofiber, but a few return to quiescence uh, uh, to create a self-renewing population. So when Ajoy Aloysius was in the lab several years ago, he was an NCBS student who joined my lab while we were at INSTEM uh, for those few years. Um, he decided to actually look at the signaling components that were important for this transition. And he decided to look at uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, uh, just to back up, uh, what we found over the, the last several years is that regulation at multiple levels keeps these satellite cells or muscle stem cells in a poised state during quiescence. So what do I mean by poised? I mean that we have balanced epigenetic networks. We have polymerase pausing at uh, the different gene promoters, quite a large number. We have uh, a number of uh, mechanical and growth factor signals that need to be integrated. And today I'll tell you about two little stories, one on signal dependent transcription factor switching and the other one on mRNP granules and translational flux. Uh, so that uh, I can just give you a flavor of the kind of molecular analysis we have been trying. Next slide, please. Yes, so Ajay wanted, Ajay wanted to know what the signals are that switch satellite cells between quiescence and activation. And it was known that, for example, there were uh, proteins such as Wnt and HGF, which were very important for cells to become activated and which were readily observable during the first few minutes after activation. Uh, and proteins such as the notch pathway, which are important for pushing cells back into quiescence. Uh, and TGF beta as well. So uh, what Ajay found, next slide please, in collaboration with Ramanuj Dasgupta at the Genome Institute in Singapore, what Ajay found was that uh, he uh, looked at the pathway, the WIND pathway, which is a, a, a one of the you know, important developmental signaling pathways, which uh, moves its signal through binding to a, a co-receptors of the frizzled and LRP56 uh, transmembrane protein family and lead to the degradation or uh, stability of the beta catenin transcription factor, which sits in the cytoplasm and upon wind signaling becoming engaged, will move to the nucleus and displace uh, repressors from uh, uh, targeted promoters and uh, activate gene transcription. Uh, it's well known in the field that the wind signaling pathway impacted muscle cell proliferation and differentiation. But what Ajoy found was that in fact, there was a, during quiescence, there was crosstalk between this pathway and the TGF beta pathway, such that the two uh, interacting transcription factors at the level of the nucleus uh, seemed to switch uh, depending on quiescence or proliferation. Next slide, please. 
So what our model is, is that in proliferating cells, the Wnt pathway is active and beta-catenin moves into the nucleus and partners with its uh, other partner of the Wnt pathway, the left one, at active promoters, which are marked by a specific uh, uh, sequence and activates transcription of a particular set of genes that are involved in proliferation. The TGF-beta pathway in proliferating cells is uh, not very active. However, in quiescence, what happens is that engagement of TGF-beta leads to the activation of SMAD3, which is also uh, cytoplasmically located, and then moves into the nucleus and actually engages uh, with LEF1, which was the uh, originally in proliferating cells, the partner of beta-catenin. So this transcription factor uh, switching actually seems to be important for establishing the quiescent uh, phase. And uh, this work was published a few years ago. Uh, next slide, please. So quiescence is uh, regulated at multiple levels, as I said. And um, one of the things that we found was that there was globally repressed transcription, uh, that there were epigenetic modifications that were needed for quiescence. Uh, maintenance. More recently, we found that uh, um, quiescence is associated with the extension of a primary cilium, which is this little antenna which sticks out of the, the cell and is involved in signaling. Um, and that, uh, as I just told you, that uh, Ajoy's work showed that uh, there was this transcription factor uh, crosstalk that regulates uh, uh, quiescence. So next slide, please. So basically quiescent cells are poised to proliferate and differentiate, but they're held in check. And so how is this balance regulated? Uh, I told you that in previous work, we looked at balanced repression versus silencing by chromatin regulators. Uh, and we also wanted to know what the cytoplasmic location of this balance might be, if, if at all. The next slide, please. So, you would know that mRNAs exiting the nucleus have two different fates. They can either go directly into a translating pool of polysomes, or they can be held in a repressed state uh, in a non-translating pool, which sometimes associates with repressors and are held in uh, uh, conglomerations or uh, uh, complexes called P bodies uh, or stress granules. Next uh, slide. So these diffuse RNA binding proteins, uh, which hold on to um, some uh, uh, RNAs, and I, I should back up and say that, you know, RNAs are never naked uh, nucleic acid molecules. They're always coated with RNA binding proteins from, the, from birth to death. And when they exit the nucleus, they just switch uh, the sort of constellation of RNA binding proteins with which they're associated. Some stay back in the nucleus and some accompany these RNAs into the cytoplasm. Now, in the cytoplasm, you have two forms of these RNA binding proteins, some which are diffusely located in the cytoplasm are non-functional, but others are phase separated uh, into uh, little self-organizing bodies called mRNP granules. Uh, there are many different kinds of mRNP granules, so I'll just call them mRNP granules because uh, P bodies and stress granules, uh, all uh, there are multiple different RNA binding proteins which are interacting with them, and so I'll just stick to the mRNP granule uh, terminology. And these are critical for executing mRNA fate. Uh, next uh, slide. So in these stress or storage granules, you have one constellation of uh, molecules, proteins, which are associated with uh, these mRNAs. And uh, shown here is a, a number of different ones. You don't have to remember any of the names except for potentially FMRP, which I will talk about later, which is a translational repressor. And next slide, please. You also have DK granules or P bodies, which where the mRNAs appear to be turning over much more rapidly. And these are because of the functional 
uh, association of different types of ribonucleases and enhancers of ribonucleases, uh, such as uh, the, the decapping proteins and the enhancers of that fate, uh, and uh, the, uh, typified by a molecule called DCP1A, uh, which is typical of the DK granules. Next slide, please. So this is the team that studied uh, uh, the MRNP granules in quiescent muscle cells. Um, we, we started this work uh, while I was at INSTEM uh, with Farah Patel and Malini Pillay and Nainita Roy. And then this got continued when I moved back to CCMB and Sweta Sundar has been the, the primary work. Uh, uh, done the primary work, supported by all these other people. And this was a collaboration with our colleagues in King's College, uh, Simon Hughes and Pete Zamet, who are both uh, uh, in vivo muscle biologists. Uh, next slide, please. So little was known in, in about these MRNP granules and skeletal muscle, but a pioneering piece of work from Colin Christ when he was a postdoc at uh, Margaret Buckingham's lab in the Pasteur Institute showed that in fact, uh, critical transcripts such as the uh, molecular determinant of muscle MIF5 are held in uh, an untranslated state uh, in the quiescent cell in an MRNP granule. And upon activation, these transcripts are released into the translating pool so that these cells now very rapidly assume a myogenic fate and uh, uh, proliferate and move towards myogenesis and repair. Um, more recently, there have been work from Brad Olwyn and the, the, the absolute pioneer of MRNP granules, Roy Parker, who discovered them and called them P bodies. Uh, where they've shown that uh, molecules like TDP43, which is an important neuronal uh, uh, granule, uh, the, the RNA uh, and RNA form these amyloid-like myogranules in regenerating muscle. So, but there was really not much else known about these. And we were intrigued because we had made the observation that the, the types of uh, mRNP granule proteins, which were uh, enriched in quiescent versus proliferating cells seems to indicate that there were uh, major differences. And we wanted to figure out what that might be due to and what consequences that might have. Next slide, please. Could I have the next slide? Okay. So we decided to just start with a very descriptive exploration of what kinds of mRNP granules are there in muscle stem cells using these uh, the single fiber uh, uh, system where you isolate single muscle fibers with their associated muscle stem cells sitting still in their niche and immunostain them to look with antibodies to probe for the kinds of different uh, mRNP granule proteins that might be present and look by microscopy. Next slide, please. And what you can see here are two types of, of uh, uh, muscle stem cell preparations on their uh, associated myofibers. The quiescent ones are sitting as singlets, and you can see that the proliferating one has made a little clone uh, of cells. It's divided twice, and you have four cells sitting together. This is just uh, uh, to orient you. Next slide, please. So we looked first at F, uh, FMRP, which is the, the product of the fragile X mental retardation uh, locus. And this has uh, multiple RNA binding domains and mutations in this gene are very well known for the uh, uh, generation of the fragile X, which is an autism spectrum disorder. And it's known that molecularly FMRP actually inhibits ribosomal translocation. Uh, and therefore prevents uh, 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 the um, uh, synthesis of proteins, but it protects mRNAs from nucleases and stabilizes these transcripts. So you can see that there's kind of a balance here as well between turnover and functional translation. And that is fed into by the action of FMRP. Next slide, please. I'm just showing you here a schematic of the D, uh, DCP1A, which is a DK factor and associated with P bodies. It's a co-activator of the main decapping enzyme, which removes the five prime cap 
and allows the mRNA now to be, become a substrate for rapid turnover. It's also involved in nonsense mediated decay, uh, which is triggered by premature termination codons and AU rich elements. So next slide, please. So what we found was, it was interesting that the RNP granules in the quiescent satellite cells seems to share features with storage granules. So I'm showing you here a single uh, satellite cell uh, stained with fMRP, and you can see that there's uh, enrichment of these green granules uh, in the cytoplasm. The, the satellite cell is marked with Pac7 in red, and this, uh, multiple different forms of uh, proteins like GW182, fMRP, and others, which all are associated with RNP granules of the storage type, uh, seems to be enriched in the quiescent cell. However, if you looked at the uh, mRNA decay complex, they were undetectable in the quiescent cell. So that suggested that the that decay was uh, much reduced during quiescence. And this, in fact, has been something that has been observed by our lab as well as many other labs that have seen that there seems to be a bulk stabilization of transcripts, uh, which goes along with the reduced transcription uh, that happens during um, quiescence. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm sorry for this busy slide, but it's simply to tell you that if you look at the, the last zoomed fMRP in red uh, on the, the right-hand slide, of, or my right, your left, perhaps, uh, uh, the right-hand slide of the uh, slide, that uh, you can see that there's an, uh, a, in the quiescent cell, there is a, a lot of the fMRP. And this sort of starts to, uh, at 24 hours, which is the third, uh, slide down or the third uh, panel down, um, it, it becomes diffuse uh, and uh, uh, less uh, uh, granular. Whereas DCP1A, which is in gray right next to the, uh, uh, the fMRP, is undetectable during quiescence, but becomes assembled over the time course of activation. So this suggests that there's this dynamic expression and it's, it's in opposing ways. So now when you think about it, what you're saying is that translational repressors, which are stabilizing mRNAs, are highly enriched and active in the quiescent state and become less so as the cell becomes activated. Whereas DCP1A, which is a decay factor, is not present or not accumulated in granules, functional granules during quiescence, but becomes assembled during activation and actually uh, causes turnover of uh, uh, mRNAs as the cells become activated, clearing out the earlier stored transcripts. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so again, I'm sorry for the busy slide, but what we did was we went then to our cellular model to recapitulate, to see whether the expression profiles uh, recapitulated what we saw in vivo. And the bottom line is, yes, they were. The fMRP protein abundance uh, using Western blots, et cetera, was maintained in the quiescent G0 phase. And the DCP1A protein was reduced in, in G0. And this got reversed as the cells got activated. Next slide, please. So this is to show you how we look at the puncta using confocal microscopy. We can see that these two different granules are absolutely distinct granules. You will never find them in the same place. And they, uh, so they're non-overlapping and they have different uh, uh, assembly uh, phases. The fMRP puncta enriched in quiescence and the DCP puncta enriched as the cell becomes activated. So the, the G0, uh, represents the quiescent phase and R3 represents the, uh, the activation phase. And down below are simply graphs showing you the quantitation, but that's not so important. Uh, next slide, please. So again, sorry, uh, this is a, a, a super busy slide and I simply won't go through it all. I will simply tell you that we did a, a polysome analysis, which is essentially isolating all of the translating ribosomes in the cell, distributing them on a gradient and looking at 
uh, what are the proteins which are associated with them as well as what are the transcripts. And what this actually showed was that there was a major translational block in G0 and or quiescence and the transcripts accumulated in the mRNP fraction, which is essentially in the non-functional, non-translating fraction in G0. And then they got shifted towards uh, the, uh, the polysomes when cells were proliferating or activated. Next slide, please. So what we see is that there's a reciprocal regulation of mRNPs and translation during this quiescence and reactivation uh, uh, switch. And uh, fMRP were enriched in, in quiescence and DCP1 in uh, the proliferating cells. Next. We then went back because we see, uh, we're lucky enough to be able to have access to fMR1 knockout mice. So fMR1 is the, the, the gene uh, encoding fMRP and Shona Chatterjee at NCBS, as you know, has been studying autism spectrum disorders for many years and has made significant contributions in that area. And he was, uh, uh, since he was studying only the, the, the neural uh, uh, cells, we were lucky enough to be able to simply get the muscles from the same mice uh, that he had sacrificed for looking at the brains. And what we found was that it, very interestingly, there was a reduced a cross-sectional area of the myofibers in the muscle of these mice, suggesting that there was a homeostatic problem. And in fact, so that's shown, for example, in the green dot plot up on, to, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that the cross-sectional area of the myofibers is much smaller in the fMR1 mice, suggesting that the muscle stem cells were not as active and not capable of generating uh, full caliber muscle fibers. So if you isolated the muscle stem cells using flow cytometry from either the wild type or the, or the knockout mice, what we found was that the myofibers had very reduced, uh, the muscle stem cells had very reduced proliferation. <coughs> I'll wind up in a couple of minutes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And so what Shweta did was to use knockdown analysis in culture to see if we could recapitulate that in vivo phenotype. And in fact, what she found was that knocking down DCP1A had an increased uh, proliferation phenotype, whereas knocking down FMRP decreased proliferation. So again, that points to a sort of reciprocal functioning of these two proteins. Next slide, please. So I think we'll skip uh, another couple of slides because <coughs> these are details. Next slide. <coughs> what was very interesting was that Shweta found that these two proteins actually undergo cross-regulation at the level of granule assembly. So not only did these two proteins have altered regulation during quiescence and activation, but they seem to cross-regulate each other. If you knocked down DCP1, which was the regulator of decay, you had an increase in the amount of fMRP. And if you knocked down fMRP, which was the translational repressor, you had an increase in DCP1A. So what that suggests is the hypothesis that altering the different the flux of different transcripts through distinct puncta could alter the profile of the protein synthesized, which would impact cell proliferation. We don't yet have direct evidence for this, but we do have evidence that the pro that the transcripts appear to show different abundances. We don't yet know at what level. Next slide, please. So the model that we have is that when you deplete uh, the decay factor, these cells now become hyperproliferative and resistant to entering quiescence. Whereas when you deplete 
FMRP, which is the translational repressor, you have an increased turnover of particular proliferative RNAs and decreased proliferation with an aberrant quiescent phenotype. Next slide, please. I, I'll skip this summary just and just say that uh, what our study tells us is that cells are monitoring the global transcript usage versus stability. And it's, it appears that FMRP and DCP1A interaction, uh, not direct interaction, but uh, genetic interaction, uh, appears to be a central component of this. Next slide, please. Uh, so this, this work was published in uh, Skeletal Muscle last year. Next slide, please. Uh, so what I hope I've convinced you is that potentially understanding the molecular attributes of quiescence has led to different kinds of insights that might actually allow us to uh, develop therapeutic avenues in the future, simply by being able to uh, assist cells in returning to quiescence and increasing their self-renewal capability and protecting them from the uh, destruction that happens during uh, the damage response. Next slide, please. <clears throat> it's very interesting to us that also quiescence seems to uh, affect phenotypes at two different ends of the spectrum. The failure to exit quiescence leads to the lack of repair and degeneration, whereas defective quiescence, the inability to enter quiescence may actually underlie both tumor formation and degenerative disease. So we think that this is something that requires uh, a fair amount of uh, uh, study. And indeed, there are labs uh, uh, all over the world that are studying this at a, a, a much deeper level than, than our own. Next slide, please. So our conclusions uh, are that quiescence or dormancy is critical for sustained regeneration, that the age-related loss of muscle stem cell function is associated with the shift of quiescence to senescence. I didn't talk about this earlier, but this is the work of Pura Munoz in, uh, in Spain. Uh, and what we have tried to do is to identify new nodes for intervention to modulate stem cell proliferative behavior. And we hope eventually to directly mod modulate this in vivo. We're not there yet. Uh, transplantation therapies would be very challenging in a very distributed tissue like muscle. And it may be more effective to target the endogenous stem cells with drugs, uh, including gene therapy in the future that might modulate their function. Uh, I think you can skip the next two slides, which are just, uh, <clears throat> yeah. These are two collaborative efforts that we have ongoing, one with Ana Ferrero, next slide, and one with um, Alok Bhattacharya uh, in two different models of uh, muscle disease. Next slide, please. <clears throat> oh, I, I, I just, I want to just point out some very preliminary studies of ours where we've been trying to look, use uh, single cell RNA sequencing to look at the heterogeneity of cells in vivo. And what you can see is, uh, you know, you would imagine that if you purify what you think are muscle stem cells, <clears throat> that you should get a singular population, but that's not the case. You see this huge distribution of mononucleated cells in skeletal muscle. There's a wide variety of cells and in the center are the muscle stem cells and progenitors in red. Uh, this this work is was done by a postdoc, a former postdoc, Gunjan Purohit, with uh, Dr. Divya Tej uh, Saupati at uh, uh, CCMB NGS facility. Next slide. These are just two different uh, comparisons of our work with uh, uh, published work uh, to show that we are uh, uh, in the region of being able to isolate uh, these muscle stem cells and do their single cell profiling. Next. Uh, you can skip through these. These are just uh, pictures that show the different types of... <clears throat> so in summary, uh, I thank you all for your attention and uh, just want to reiterate that muscle stem cells are active during development, but then they are kept in a sleeping state in muscle, uh, adult muscle tissue, that they wake up to repair damaged muscle, but need to go back to, sleep to make new muscle stem cells. They become exhausted in muscle diseases and muscles degenerate. 
we've found a new way of forcing stem cells to sleep more and become better stem cells, we hope. We're now testing these ideas in most models of muscle disease to see if we can improve muscle repair. So uh, in the, uh, in, to just recapitulate everything, understanding these, uh, the, this dormant state could lead to new drugs for tissue repair and regeneration. The next slide. Just keep going. Yeah, sorry. I think you're going the wrong way. Yeah, so this is just the lab uh, <clears throat> situated in a myotube. Uh, and uh, most of these are have now moved on. The ones with the asterisks are still in the lab as the lab is uh, um, shutting down over the next year uh, as I've moved to the India Alliance. Uh, the last slide, just to thank all my funding sources, my wonderful students and uh, uh, my collaborators, and of course the major contributors, the mice who literally gave their lives for the study. And I thank you all uh, for listening to me and hope I haven't gone too much over time. Yeah. Happy to take questions. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very I'm much uh, for this wonderful, uh, wonderful talk. Uh, also enormous amount of work that you have been doing Along with collaborators, um, I think you know. As I said, you know, we should uh, take questions now. I asked Professor. Uh, there is uh, a Mohit Jolly of IIC has a question on the chat box. Mohit, do, would you like to unmute and ask it directly, or I can sure. it Thank yeah. Thanks, Rahul. I just uh, excellent talk. Hi, hi, Mohit. I was, I was interested in the double negative feedback loop that you talked about so between FMRP and PCP1. So, so, so we have been looking at such loops in the context of transcription factors uh, at various uh, self criticism points. And yes. these loops uh, can give rise to both reversible and irreversible transitions. So I'm wondering in this particular context, when would you want the transition to be reversible versus irreversible? So, you know, it's not clear to me yet at a molecular level, and you, you know, you uh, understand this much better than me. I think, in terms of the network models, it's not clear to me how, uh, you know, when you have a, a whole network of molecules that are working together and, uh, you know, uh, cross-regulating in multiple different ways, uh, either enhancing or repressing. Um, at what point does it become a tipping point where the cell integrates these? interactions to actually take a decision to uh, reversibly or irreversibly go down a particular path. So uh, because both of these molecules, say in the case of DCP1A and FMRP, they are both affecting um, multiple mRNAs or mRNPs through their function. And the mechanism by which they are cross-regulating each other is not yet known. I don't yet know whether, for example, FMRP is directly repressing uh, DCP1A translation mm -hmm. and DCP1A, I would imagine, is directly affecting FMRP turnover, but it might be through a number of intermediaries. So it's kind of difficult for me to uh, uh, sort of visualize where that point might be in this uh, sort of huge network. And I, I would really be interested in talking to you more to see if there are experiments that would be suggested by the network models that you would be able to, um, um, you know, uh, come up with theoretically. Definitely, that, that would be fantastic. I would uh, uh, chat more with you. So, but just one question and uh, then we chat offline. So the mode of regulation uh, in this cross connection, is that expected to be at a similar time scale or is one of them much slower than the other? Yeah, so I have really no idea. I would imagine that the translational repression might be faster than the turnover, but I, I you know, I could be completely wrong. Uh, and uh, again, as I said, because we don't know what the actual node of interaction is, whether it's through an intermediary or whether it's a direct sort of uh,
connection between these two proteins acting on each other's transcripts? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Fantastic thank question, you. though. Yeah, Thanks something so for me to think Excellent. about. Yeah. And, um, thank you. Thanks, uh, Mohit. Are there any more questions? Uh, if you can unmute and ask. In the meantime, I have a couple of questions uh, which are pretty nice, probably. One is you mentioned that uh, um, uncontrolled uh, um, uh, crisis can lead to like tumors or cancer. Um, one doesn't hear of muscular cancer much, right? I mean, you might have. Maybe yeah, so there are. Course, but, um, yeah, there are. They're not very uh, common. There are two types of yeah. muscular tumors uh, broadly. They're called rhabdomyosarcomas. So they fall into the soft tissue sarcomas, but the muscle ones, there are pediatric ones uh, and uh, there are uh, more late onset ones, but they are rare. Uh, but they do exist and there are multiple different types of mutations that are now being associated with them. Uh, whether the target is the muscle stem cell itself or the environment uh, is not known for some but in some cases, the the uh, it's known that there are particular genes responsible. Yeah. Yeah, it seemed a bit counterintuitive to me that most tissues don't have these quiescent stem cells and muscles do. Therefore, you would expect accidental, uncontrolled proliferation maybe to happen more likely in muscles than in other tissues. But so actually, the, most to. tissues do have uh, stem cells. So even the brain, which was thought to be the, the sort of the, the final frontier and you didn't want to mess with the brain once you formed all those neurons and made all those connections, it's very clear that there are particular regions of the brain which have proliferative progenitor activity. And in fact, it's turning out that even you know molecules such as antidepressants seem to actually target some of these progenitors and, and stain them. So uh, work of Vidita Vaidya, for example, who's doing the kind of pharmacology uh, and molecular analysis of these uh, uh, pathways, is uh, it's very interesting. So there are, I mean, there are different models for the way in which stem cells uh, uh, are formed and persist uh, in adult tissues, but pretty much every tissue has a stem cell. Um, there is a raised hand from Devya Singh. Uh, would you like to unmute and chat? Uh, ask. Yes. Um, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks, Shoksna. It was a really great talk. I hope you can see me too. Hi, Devya. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, I had a couple of questions actually. Um, the first, maybe a little naive, and it's a follow-up of what uh, Rahul already asked. Um, have you? Or do you know if there's a with the the module of fMRP and DCP1 is conserved uh, in other niches uh, where you may see um, quiescent and proliferating stem cells? Uh, I have not looked, uh, our lab has not looked ourselves, but I have no reason to believe that it doesn't because these are very widely expressed molecules. Uh, even though fMRP was first identified uh, in the context of uh, Fragile X syndrome and the autism spectrum disorders, it's very clear that it's expressed in multiple tissues. It's just highly enriched in brain, and it seems to have a particular, you know, a greatest phenotype in brain. Uh, but the fact is, you know, what our uh, study showed was that even muscle had that phenotype, which was not to be expected because the mice seem to, you know, move around okay, etc. So that. There doesn't seem to be. So I, I have every expectation that this particular module would exist uh, in all, uh, in a wide variety of cells where fMRP and DCP1A are uh, expressed. Thanks. Uh, and the second question I had was, uh, was related to the first part of your talk, where you said the emergence of a primary cilium uh, coincided with the state of the cell being quiescent. Yes. Um, so I was wondering if uh, wind signaling is known to happen in the psyllium. So I was wondering if the wind uh, TGFP signaling that you said is important for the cells to either remain quiescent or switch to the differentiated state. Do you know if this happens in the psyllium? And um, would the proportion or would the population of um, cells, quiescent cells that you're able to isolate from, um, from the tissue, would that change if you used an activator of cilium uh, development or inhibited cilium development in any way? 
Yeah, all good questions. We don't know whether uh, uh, the, the, the wind signaling phenotype that we saw with respect to the transcription factor switch in quiescence, whether that's mediated through the cilium or not. Uh, uh, these are difficult experiments to do simply because localizing molecules to the cilium using uh, sort of uh, immunohistochemistry, immunocytochemistry, et cetera, is very tough. Uh, and the kind of in vivo labeling, genetic labeling that one would need to do in order to do that, we are not yet uh, at that stage. Uh, but we would love to be, you know, eventually able to do such experiments. What we do know is that very interestingly, if you suppress the formation of the cilium, okay, by knocking down a molecule that's responsible for allowing the cilium to grow, which is one of the, the proteins, uh, IFT88, which is a transport, pro, you know, uh, a regulator of the transport process, which allows the building of the cytoskeleton inside the, the, the cilium. Uh, if you knock that down and the cilium is not extended, uh, you actually enhance the signaling through multiple different pathways. Wind signaling, you know, TGF beta signaling, uh, hedgehog signaling, PDGF signaling, etc., uh, which suggests that even though the cilium is extended during quiescence, right? It's a little bit of a conundrum. You have you have this antenna which is supposed to be a signaling antenna, right? but it's extended in the phase of the cell cycle where the cell is supposed to be sitting there quietly and not responding to any signals. Then you knock it down and the cell is now, you know, fully capable. In fact, it's what it suggests is that the cilium is actively suppressing signals. So there's something about the configuration of the cilium and the way it connects to the rest of the cell that is uh, creating that milieu of uh, an inhibitory signaling phenotype. So uh, that's something that uh, <clears throat> we, uh, you know, we, we followed for a certain period of time, and uh, now I, we've kind of switched that uh, a, um, project to actually trying to figure out what's happening with the centrosome, which is at the base of the cilium. And Preeti, my student, uh, is looking at that. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Joseph. Thank uh, thanks, Devya. Um, is there any other question? Perhaps one last question from me. Um, is there any difference between different uh, um, uh, striated muscles in different parts of the body? Uh, the reason I ask is they seem to develop differently, like uh, biceps and thigh muscles are bigger and some of the, and there's a common theory. I was wondering how accurate it is that Exercise develops muscles by causing micro injuries to muscles, uh, which are then repaired, uh, yes. presumably by the mechanism you talked about. So yes. is that uh, more or less the same across all muscles? It is more or less the same, except there are, you know, depending on the sort of molecular phenotype of different muscles, which is a, a sort of a composite phenotype of the kinds of different myosins that they express, which are the motor proteins, uh, which build the, the specialized muscle cytoskeleton. So there are, broadly speaking, there are fast muscles and slow muscles, right? So you have, for example, the difference between a marathon runner and a sprinter is the uh, rapidity with which they uh, use their muscles and the, the tonal quality of their muscles, right? During training. Yeah. And uh, so these two different types of muscles. So, uh, well, if you're a non-vegetarian, you would also know these as the red meat and the white meat, okay? Uh, when, you're, when you're eating chicken. Uh, so... Uh, these seem to have different, uh, slightly different numbers of, of the stem cells, okay? So, uh, but by and large, they, they repair at relatively uh, uh, similar rates, you know? Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, thanks a lot, Jotsna. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask our director, uh, Professor Abhijit, would he like to say something in summing up? I'm really thankful, you know, uh, for a nice talk. And uh, I mean, even people like me, who uh, is not a you know, biologist, we could understand actually, you know, quite a lot of things from your very nice presentation, particularly for our younger colleagues and also the students here. It is really a very nice uh, exposure to the field actually and uh, motivate them to, you know, 
Look thank at you. Those things, yeah. Thanks for you know. Uh, Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Professor nice Ravindran. I thought, yeah. I, I hope I wasn't uh, sort of too much into molecular gobbledygook for the mathematician who loves the abstraction of <laughs> numbers. <laughs> it, was, it was very nice, actually. We yeah. really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, yeah. everybody, for yeah. participating. Hopefully, you know, we can have, uh, you know, offline talks at some time when, when you have time, Surely. actually. You know, we'll Surely, be happy to have I would you here. Love to visit. I would absolutely love to visit. Yes, yeah. look Thank forward you. to inviting you soon. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah. Okay, thanks everybody for attending. Thanks and, everyone uh, for okay. sticking with muscle for an hour. <laughs> bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.